So we are this morning going to talk about this thing called the product puzzle because that's what it feels like sometimes. Um, and so this session this morning should be really interactive and just open. We've got folks on the stage who are doing a number of incredible things in their markets, really trying things, doing innovations, trying, failing, restarting, managing through, and a list of products that you have available to you to try. And as we talked about yesterday in the revenue session, sometimes trying to figure out what to do next is where the really big issue happens. So I know that many of you have questions around these things. So we've got this great group of panelists that we can, we can, um, we can ask for advice on what they did, what they do differently, if it worked, how they applied it, um, and how to sell it. So to get started, why don't we just do introductions in case you haven't met any of these fabulous folks and we can start with Wendy. Thank you. Um, I'm Wendy Cohen. I'm the business director for Berkeley Side. We are um, the de facto newspaper of Berkeley, California. I am Scott Brodbeck. I'm the founder, editor, publisher of uh, Arlington Now, Rest Now, and a site called Border Stand in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, my name is Doug Hardy. I'm with uh, Connecticut News Junkie in Connecticut, in Connecticut. and uh, my wife and I uh, cover politics. Connecticut News Junkie in Connecticut. So, <laughs> CT I News like Junkie. That, I like that you said that. But not Meg State. I'm Kelly Gilfillan, um, COO of Bigger Media. We have eight online uh, daily, daily hyperlocal news sites. Uh, Brentwood homepage was our first. Then we added Franklin, Spring Hill, Nolansville, and then we also have the county. Uh, Williamson Source and Rutherford Source, and we're launching our eighth on Monday for Bellevue, which is our first foray into Metro Nashville. Is that right? Uh, Traven Rice, co-founder of The Lowdown. We're in Lower East Side of Manhattan, uh, and I run the business side of it, and also manage the arts and culture. Very nice. So, see, great group. So, this morning, I, I've just compiled a list of all these products that sit that sit out there in the, the revenue space that you all have to choose, select, pick, work on. A lot of them are shiny objects that you hear. So display advertising, extended read forms, real estate platforms or approaches, jobs, programmatic advertising, Facebook, native advertising, cause marketing, special sections, video, native commerce, native content creation, directories, membership, and, and, and more. So of these, I think we've had some great conversations over the past couple of days about several of them, but I know that many of you still have questions. One of the questions, and I think one of the things that we can start with with the group, um, and then we'd like to open this up to your questions um, as well, but I know there are multi uh, multiple applications around native and lots of conversation around how native is working. Several folks have indicated that they, they're having some great success with native. So a couple of folks on the panel are doing different applications of native, so why don't we start there. Scott? Draven? <laughs> Somebody with a microphone? So, yeah, we, I would say that we have more and more success with sponsored content. Um, I find that to be, at the moment, the most effective. Um, we package it with banners, usually. Obviously, realtors love featuring their open houses, but we've found a lot of nonprofits love getting the word out, love the opportunity to have it be, you know, content on the site. Um, we're just really clear about labeling it. Um, but I think that's one of our biggest focuses right now is sponsor content. Mm -hmm. we, um, we have two different models. So on the home pages, um, we have very specific places and we call it a business spotlight and then we, you know, it's obvious that it's an advertorial. We have showcase homes, which we write, but the customer has the editing, you know, rights to it before we go live. Um, last year, at the end of the year to sell annual packages if they bought an annual advertising display ad contract um, we would we would give them a quarterly business spotlight and that really drove up our annual contracts at the end of the year and some of them even like paid in full for the year which was kind of cool at the end but um, and then on the source side which is our county sites that um, my partner Steve started they have a much more intense uh, native program and they have, they call it a core partner and basically these, there's a consistent stream of 
stories about it, but they're generally packaged like a column. We're still writing the content most of the time, almost all the time. Um, for, and a great example of that is Three Dog Bakery. And we, they, are, they do a lot of holistic dog care. And so Steve came up, what, well, what we do is we sit down with the customer at the, at the beginning of the contract and we make up a quarterly plan. And so every quarter we're sitting down and we're planning out the entire time of what all those columns are gonna be. Um, this does include a big package of display ads. Um, the way Steve set their site up, there's six placements for non-core partners and then there's the seventh placement for a core partner, and which is kind of the big banner across the top. But everybody has six ads and they run throughout the whole place. Everybody's running in the same ways. And, but the ones who have these, the we call them local expert or core partners. There's a couple of different levels, 2,000 and 900. And, but, the, it, but it's consistent content and it's presented in different ways like, you know, car care or holistic, I think it was holistic dog care 101. Where are you, Steve? <laughs> Is that right? Holistic care? Okay. And, um, but uh, realtors. So with the realtor, it was um, neighborhood of the week and Susan Gregory is at the top. And um, the core partners get exclusivity at that level. And so that's why they pay $2,000 a month. And then the other ones, there's really not exclusivity, but it's just constant content. So it's a very different model from the homepage model, but both of them are working. Mm -hmm. But the native content is pushing revenue higher, for sure. Very good. So for us, uh, native advertising is great. Um, and it's great uh, for the reason uh, that Traven said is that it's effective. It is effective for our clients if done right. So native is about 40% of our business at this point. Uh, for a while it was looking like it might be like 50-50 uh, with uh, display advertising. I think display still has the edge. Um, but just like display advertising, yeah, there you can screw up sponsored content, uh, native advertising, whatever you want to call it. Um, you. Just as you, you know, focus on, uh, you know, you have a readership focus, hopefully, when it comes to writing your news articles. You know, what do they want? How do they want it? How do you present it to them? Um, you need to be bringing that same focus to native. Um, you know, whether it's, um, if you're writing it, uh, you know, in-house, then obvious, that's an obvious, but uh, there also needs to be some coaching if it's something uh, that the client is writing. And for us, there we have, a number of varieties of sponsored content that I won't uh, bore you with uh, the exact details, but you know it's anything from a, a regular like weekly feature written by one of our um, sponsors to uh, you know a one-off uh, thing about an event that we're writing for for a client, um, and so maintaining. Uh, a readership focus and, and, and also don't give your native content the short shrift. Uh, for a while, uh, you know, it was just something that we copied and pasted onto the site. And actually a better experience for your reader um, so we uh, you know I, I remain very bullish on, on, on native advertising where we are kind of getting to a place where you know I wonder if there's so, such a thing as too much uh, on a site if you know there needs to be a, a, a natural place where you 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 say okay well this is the amount we're gonna publish this day we're kind of there now um, but just there's a finite amount of reader attention and so I've been kind of thinking about that. The one other thing I'll, I'll say on it is um, for some, some publishers, there's a temptation given, uh, you know, people's strong background in journalism ethics to give native advertising the absolute scarlet letter treatment and, 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 and you know, present it like it's toxic waste on the site. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you want it to be clearly labeled. It, it is a bad thing if people, if someone reads a, a native ad and then later discovers that it's sponsored and they didn't know it, there's gonna be a negative reaction to that. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, while you're clearly labeling the content, you don't wanna like label it so profusely like, this is an ad, you might as well be saying don't read this. So you need to strike a balance. But you don't do it in neon. Uh, 
in neon. So for, for us, the label is, we do some sponsored editorial. I do uh, accept a quarterly report from a local real estate company. It says, brought to you by Red Oak at the beginning. It says, brought to you Red Oak with a link at the end. Um, but we're pretty rigid about it. We don't accept more than two a month and at this point, and it has to be, that has to go through our editorial team to make sure that it's really information and not promotional. If you want to promote, you can do an email blast, mm -hmm. but um, it's been really successful for us. It's about home, it's called Home Truths, and it's about the uh, housing market in Berkeley. They got national pickup because they wrote about that the average price of a house now in Berkeley is 1.1 million. Um, and so they've been very successful for them. We also say that it, the content belongs to us for a week, and then they can reuse it however they want. Um, we just had one for a Shakespeare festival where, again, they got to explain a particular play. And I have one coming up with a healthcare group that wants, it's for providing health for elders, and they want to run it November 15th so that it's open for discussion at Thanksgiving dinners. But we're very rigid about the editorial, whether they give us bullet points and we do some rewriting, um, but we won't publish anything without making sure that it is really information for our readers. On, on the, the issue of labeling, a few years back, the uh, FTC came out with some pretty good guidance on how you can clearly label what sponsored content is and the, the, the words that should be used and uh, how to, you know, the, the lines that you shouldn't go across and trying to cover up the fact that it's really basically an advertisement after a fashion. And um, you know, we should all be aware that if you don't make it clear that somebody is paying you to put something in your publication, you're breaking the law and can run into some pretty serious fines. So that, that real quick, that said, um, a lot of us have in the political space, uh, in any kind of publication, I've accepted op-eds from people in the community or uh, special interest or whatever over, over the years and uh, as an added value, you know, to a big advertising contract. So like there's an ugly gray area in there and when you, when you make the switch, well that's the question and, and when you make the switch from uh, not using sponsored content to, to offering it, all, you start, things start to get really muddy and maybe you're undermining your advertising and things like that. And, you know, we we, uh, we started using it, and like it felt like six months before that, I told Matt Dorenzo I would over my dead body, and then like six <laughs> months later, I said, like, "Yeah, we're using sponsored content." Long, long, <laughs> long snarky <laughs> laughter. Oh, you know, yeah, and it's his fault. But um, so <laughs> we we when we started using op eds, try to do this quickly. Uh, we said, "Well, let's be balanced, like a newspaper editorial page." And so I needed some people on the left, I needed some people on the right. And uh, we had a college student who was working part time for a think tank uh, on the on the right, and some other folks that were, uh, you know, on the other side of it. But basically, that college student became a full time employee for for that think tank, and uh, we were paying him. You know, it wasn't he needed the money, uh, and we wanted the balance. But at the end of the day, uh, he moved on. Another person came on, also was hired by that think tank, and uh, we're paying her. We were paying her, and and essentially. Um, she became a lobbyist, you know. So we were basically paying this lobbyist extra money to provide us with content that pretty much any other publication in this space was going to charge a lot of money for, you know. So when we finally had the conversation, it ended up being like seven seven thousand dollar swing. Uh, they they instead of us paying her, they joined our directory and bought some sponsored content, and it just it's a no brainer. At this point, it's a no-brainer, especially in politics. And I know Trip Jennings knows this: an op-ed from a special interest or somebody representing a special interest, special interest is the argument. Uh, and advertising is essentially a way to get people to go to the page to see the argument. So it's like a whole step closer. Uh, it's a it's a really really viable uh, stream if you're covering politics for sure. 
so a, a couple of things just to add, and then I'm going to do a quick summary. You guys can see if we missed anything or if there's something else we need to talk about in Native. So I'm just going to add on political advertising. Political advertising requires specific disclaimers be attached to every piece of political advertising. You can find those out specifically for your state. Make sure that you use them. Uh, in support of and lobbyist ads require those as well. So just don't miss that guideline. Uh, the other thing uh, that you want to be sure of in guidelines is that in political advertising, political candidates or political advertising all has to be charged at the same rate. So regardless of volume or whatever, you can't have, you can't differentiate or show any difference in rate. It could indicate preference to a candidate, which you can't do. Okay, so in summarizing on native, clearly label it. It's a decision that you have to make for your brand. You can look at applications around Native that really fit within your brand. You have folks on the stage here who are all having success in generating revenue from this. The great thing about Native content or Native advertising is that you can pick, choose, and decide how you want to display it and how you want to bring it forward on your website based on your content, your community, and what's important. Um, so what did I miss? I just want to mention uh, metrics on this is a really, we're, it's total wild west right now. There aren't great metrics. Like you've got page views on the content. Um, if you're doing a sponsored link on your homepage, I recommend using a bit.ly link so that you can actually give them a screen grab or something. Uh, of course, I'm on the cheap. I don't have the upgraded bit.ly account, but I just do a screen grab of how many clicks they got. You know, so you got to be able to give them metrics. And uh, I was just talking to John from Broad Street, and uh, he said that there's maybe a way that they could do an ad unit with the, con with the content over it that will tell uh, how far down people have read, which matters, you know, um, especially if you have like a, a thing at the bottom that says, you know, click here to join, follow us on Twitter or whatever, sign, sign up for our email list. If they never even get to that, you need to kind of know that, you know, yeah, maybe they wrote too long. So. I just want to say something quickly on that topic is that uh, you can measure outbound clicks from your sponsored content. Now there is some sponsored content that lends itself more to people clicking uh, than others. Um, but one example I cited in a uh, pre presentation I gave to like a webinar I, I gave uh, a little while ago was uh, we have uh, some real estate agents who who every week publish uh, a list of the you know newly listed properties in Arlington or newly reduced in price. And for a while, you know, we, we, I thought this was a good idea. I thought it was going to work. But for a while, we, we didn't really know how effective it was. Um, and then we uh, signed up for a service called ClickMeter, which just lets you, um, you know, do trackable links. Uh, you could do, also do that on Bitly. And it turned out uh, we were sending them 3,000 clicks per week. And at that point, we decided that that was something that is very viable, and we probably should uh, should price it a little higher than we uh, were yeah. at the time. Scott said that, and I immediately said that would, that meant rate increase. Yeah, yeah. I, to I totally where stole I'm that going. idea too. Yeah. And we also do a properties transfer, uh, property transfers list, but we call it just sold. Got that from him too, and um, and we get a thousand dollars a month for that because nice. it is such a high traffic yeah. piece. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. Any questions from you all on Native? Let me scoot. This will be my cardio this morning. <laughs> Just going to ask Scott or Kelly, can you talk about how you handle the creation of the content? Does it, do you have your in-house editorial folks that write it, or where does it come from? So, so our, our, ours is a variety. Um, it's... It's anything from the, the client writing it. And again, we coach, try to coach the client. We, we create a, a style guide for uh, you know, advertisers, for native advertisers that we send to them um, so that we don't get total uh, garbage. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, just stylistically, I, I don't want to be editing, um, you know, making something AP style, spending a lot of time doing that. But, oh, but more so, it's about coaching about how you know, to write effectively to, uh, and, it, and for us and for native, if it's going to be native, you want it to be informative. Uh, a lot of advertisers have a temptation where uh, they're going to, they want to just write nice things about themselves. You know, they want to write a press release. Uh, but what you have to inform them is that this is not a press release. This is not, so this, this is self-promotion through information, through providing value to the reader. So that, that's something that's, if they're paying you to write it and you're like telling them how to write it and you're like, and you're saying, uh, 
you have you know you don't promote yourself you there's a wrong way to say that because it sounds like they're paying you for you to write things that our readers want to read which is true but it's providing tremendous value to them I, for for uh, and for sorry. us um if we're going to write it we 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 farm it out to a freelancer okay i'm glad to you we <laughs> yeah we don't write it we just try to keep that really separate, the editorial content from the native content. So I'm happy to put it together and lay it out for them, but it's their content, and I'm happy to guide them. But we do not write it. And if they want uh, help writing it, then we would hire somebody else to do that, just to keep everything very separate and clear. So just as an FYI on writing or producing the content, there are services who do this. There's a company called eByline um, that has an online module. They write everything from, uh, you know, very soft sort of, you know, um, even blog-esque content, which folks are doing to sell to advertisers as extended services, to really great capital J journalism type stories um, uh, and everything in between so you can order it for them. The other thing that I'll say about producing content is there are, as you know, there are some fabulous journalists, some great writers who are out there who want the work. Um, and so it's not difficult in any of our markets to find somebody who would be willing to take on this content. And you can do a disclaimer on your sites that says this content is produced and provided for by others, but you can also package in an upcharge on getting that content produced as part of, as part of your fee. So, right. And we, we do pretty much all of our sponsored content it is written by the customer or a freelancer. Our, our reporters don't write it. Yeah. Just oh, one, yes, sorry. one other quick thing here is that if, if it's political, chances are it's gone through lawyers. You know, we're, we're not going to be writing policy op-eds for special interests. And uh, I would even suggest that in retail, like there are, there are advertising rules. You know, you could write something that really, if nobody gives it a good read, you could be offering something for that business that they can't afford to give by accident. You know? my, my question is, do you fact check it? And do you allow? Can we move on? And do, do, <laughs> just, no, I'm just you know, just since we are a newspaper, I thought yeah. you know maybe that would be a good idea, even in sponsored content. Do you and do you allow content comments? What was oh, oh comments? comments. So, uh, well, for us, we if the client wants us to turn off comments, they can, but people can comment on it on social. Um, so occasionally. We, we've turned off comments at the request of a client. Um, doesn't fact checking? Yes. Uh, if if there's something blatantly inaccurate, uh, we will push back. Have to. I, yeah, Have we to. make sure. I mean, we make sure this is a legitimate advertiser that what they're saying is is legitimate. And we absolutely don't want something on the site that's not real. You know, I mean, we don't check every single thing that they say about. You know, we get a lot of like preschools opening or. We make sure that we know that this this real estate listing is legitimate, but we're not we're not doing as much of like policy stuff. So, and we so, have um, we have a lawyer and a wealth management person that does a sponsored column on the home pages, and I know the lawyer <laughs> has been vetted, <laughs> um, and um, the wealth management guy he he's an LPL rep, and it has to go all the way through LPL before it ever gets to me, and I really can't change it. But um, so and then. I mean, that's really, and then the real estate stuff is pretty um, benign. It's just advice on um, what, you, what to expect at closing and things like that. So those are our only three for the home pages. And then we're really doing most of the writing on the source. We have a team of writers. Like this one is writing four stories a week for these specific clients. And um, since we're doing the writing, we know we've done the research. And so. In political, uh, we don't really get paid op-eds from yahoos you know we get it from big organizations uh who are paying people to to write it and to uh, assess the information and, and as, as you know in politics there's always a way of presenting something that is maybe stretching but kind to your agenda you know it's not maybe it's just a way of uh perspective they, they use a, they use perspective you know but it haven't had to turn any away yet but i i'm sure you know, so I'm just going to go back to label, 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 yes. 
you know, if you need to add disclaimers around those things, add disclaimers. Um, you know, the more involved you are with creating the content, fact checking the content, the more intermingled it is with your department, the, the more challenging that is. And the other thing that exists is the, the, when you have clients who are submitting content themselves and writing content themselves, you are at more risk for things that are inaccurate or not necessarily completely true, unless, like, unless they're in a really compliance-driven industry, like financial planners have so much compliance, it's difficult to you know, get, get things printed that will make a difference. So uh, other questions before we, oh, I have to run. All right. <laughs> you can try. We'll have to repeat it though. Well, my question is if you have. My question is if you have a freelancer write the actual native advertising piece. Um, <laughs> um, if you have a freelancer write that native advertising piece, does the advertiser get to vet it then and, and look at it and approve it? Yes, definitely. I mean, they're, they're the client. Um, we have standards in terms of you know, what we're going to put on the site. Uh, so what, one, one uh, lighthearted example is that I, a lot of advertisers want a lot of exclamation points in their copy for some reason. <laughs> and I turn them all into periods. <laughs> Something I'd add real quick is that the local marketing association has a, if you're, if you're really getting into native and it's going to be part of your business strategy, they have an annual conference on uh, native specifically, and I believe it's coming up uh, pretty soon. And uh, they actually have uh, a presentation each year from the FTC, from an attorney at the FTC that gives you the latest on what the FTC feels about it. Technically, uh, there are no laws around native at the moment. The FTC has issued guidelines, but there, the, there are no, there's no current legislation or ac action by the FTC that specifically addresses it. Uh, but they have basically said, do a good job of policing yourselves or there will be really soon. And uh, the, but the, um, the, they have no official, there are no official laws on a lot of this at this point. And they go over that really thoroughly at the at the native conference and it, it, it's something that I've done and I would highly recommend it if you're going to make native an ongoing part of your business model because they also talk about uh, a lot of best practices there that are that that we've been able to apply to how we're approaching native too so the phone was ringing it was mine <laughs> sorry that's like against the rules right um, so I, I'm going to circle back down there on a, co um, a comment on native, but I do want to make sure that we get to, so let's answer that question and then let's talk about events. Would you repeat that comment? The, the, uh, the name of the comment. She just wants you to repeat the name of the conference. Oh, okay. It's the local marketing association, LMA.org. You don't have to be a member to attend. They just charge you a little extra. Not, not enough to worry about joining. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Okay, so we want to save a couple of minutes for comments at the end, but let's move on quickly. The other thing that people keep asking about is events. And so some of you have dabbled in events. So can we talk about some of your experiences in events? Good, bad, ugly, great for your brand, do them again, not do them? Wendy. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have um, had a lot of success with events. Um, I have to admit that we have a huge asset that one of my partners is involved in a company that puts on international conferences um, and has uh, an extraordinary Rolodex. We decided about four years ago, we looked and realized we had this incredible asset in someone who really, uh, and when I say puts on conferences, puts on the creative aspect of them, puts together panels for international conferences, just came back last week from putting one on for the government of Argentina. Um, and we did a little research um, and decided to do something that we call Uncharted. The name Uncharted comes from this idea of looking at ideas in a different way. It's a two-day ideas festival, um, October 14th and 15th of this year we're doing it. We have a capacity in the space we use of 500 people. Um, and they are conversations, there's labs, there's music, there's dance. Um, 
this year, for the first time, we really sort of have some headliners. Of Eve Ensler of the Vagina Monologues is speaking. Uh, Kenji Lopez-Alt, who is a big restaurateur um, and is has a book that won the 2015 James Beard Award um, called Food Lab, is doing a lab on meat. Um, a man named Brad Kinzer, who's the chocolate maker for Cho Chocolate and is considered to have the best chocolate palette in the country, is doing a chocolate tasting lab. We also have a philosophy professor from UC Irvine, uh, whose book, uh, The Asshole Philosophy of Donald Trump, is speaking. <laughs> Very big, but we also have, uh, and I don't know this gentleman's name, a uh, professor from Stanford who is um, black, Republican, and gay, speaking about his positioning. Um, it's a real mix. They're conversations. They're interactive. We also pass the microphone at the end of each conversation. And... Um, as you might imagine in Berkeley, that can be quite an experience with letting everybody <laughs> speak. Uh, we do, so it's an all day Friday, we do a big party Friday night, and then all day Saturday. Primary on that in, for revenue is sponsorships. Um, ticket sales, pretty minimal in terms of the, the impact economically, it's the sponsorships. So right now our revenue breakout is about 60% advertising, 20% membership, and 20% for the event. I think that ratio is going to change this year when we are all done with the numbers. I think the event is going to uh, start increasing its percentage of what we do. But um, it's, it's, been, it's a lot of work because none of us started out as event planners. We all have a journalism background. Um, but it's getting great response from the community um, and is pulling more and more people from outside of the Bay Area who are coming in specifically for the event. So I, I, I have been dabbling in an events uh, over the past year or so, and I have actually discovered the secret to having a great event, and I'm gonna share it right now. The secret to having a great event is have admission be free and have free beer. <laughs> <laughs> so we, so we had our, our past two events were both uh, sponsored. Uh, one was by a uh, apartment building that wanted a whole bunch of people to come and see their brand new building. And the other was from a uh, beer and wine store that wanted people to come and try beer and then buy it and take it home. And uh, we offered, uh, you know, 300 tickets for each. Uh, just, we did one email blast to our uh, email subscribers, around 9,000. And within two to three hours, all 300 tickets were spoken for. So, uh, we we have tried you know events where you you pay for you pay uh, for tickets. We've tried events where um, you don't pay for tickets, but uh, the booze is, costs money. Those were uh, you know we still got people to come. Those were more moderate successes, I would say. Um, but you know if you can find the sponsor who just wants people, there is a pretty decent formula for that. Uh, and I will say so. Uh, to conclude, so uh, one of our Lion members who is not here is Jim Brady, and he is running um, two sites, one in uh, Philly called Billy Penn and another in Pittsburgh that just launched called The Incline. And uh, his, his philosophy with events um, may vary from, uh, you know, compared to others, but his philosophy is don't structure your event too much. Get people together, have, you know, beer, something to drink, maybe something to eat, and let them mingle and interact. Um, and so that's kind of the, a bit of the approach we took um, with uh, the, at least one of the last two. Um, and it was pretty successful. Your market may vary, but um, you know, that's one philosophy from someone who's um, you know, putting a lot of uh, their effort into events. I would say free beer would win, would win in any market. But, yeah, I think that's pretty um, universal. Yeah. <laughs> so um, just real quick, the, we have a kind of a weird model that uh, Steve uh, fell into kind of right before we started partnering and um, so there was this events guy who really needed help selling the sponsorships. He was great at selling the tickets but had never monetized it through sponsorships. So we said we know how to do that and um, so we had our whole team selling sponsorships for his balloon festival or his beer, bacon and bourbon and we were able to bring him some extra revenue and it was a 50-50 split. So if we brought in a $10,000 
title sponsor. We got 5,000 of it. He got 5,000. It was totally new money to him and totally new money to us. And so that's kind of our first foray into that. We do have in 2017, we're, that's one of the new divisions we're rolling out as bigger events. And so it's going to be an exciting year. But I think that that was great practice for us to partner with somebody who already had the event. We didn't have to do the event. We just got to help monetize it. Mm -hmm. so. Very smart. Very the, smart. The other thing worth noting is events are a pain in the butt. Yeah. It, it, it is a big logistical challenge. And we just, we just hired a new employee uh, as a news and events assistant. And I think a big part of her job is going to be just helping with the logistics of these events. It's very hard. It's a lot of work. So just mm -hmm. keep that in mind. So I, 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 let's, let's just touch on that for just a second because events are really, really resource taxing. If you love putting on a party, if that's something that you love to do, then events become far easier. So I was blessed in my last role. I had a, a, a girl who loved to do events. For her life was a party. Everywhere she looked, she saw event space. She was wonderful. You know, she looked at our building. I saw a building. She looked at our building and she said, I think we can do weddings here. We did. We did 10. So, I mean, you know, so she had this eye and she loved it. She, she was able to do things for events that I would have never been able to do, right? So I think it comes around skill set. And, and your capability, what you love doing. If you're not great at putting together parties, if that's if you're not, you don't love dinner parties, you don't love entertaining, and you're going to try to put on events, they're hard. The logistics is hard. All of those things are hard, and they take they're time consuming. So a couple of things on that. If you're going to do events, make sure that you plan appropriately, because the time that it takes to put them together reduces the amount of sales time in your pipeline if you have sellers. So what will happen is you're running really fast to get the event sold and then the event is done and your sellers or you, if you're selling, you have to ramp back up with new prospects to get that pipeline developed. So it's not unusual for a publisher to see a dip in revenues post-event and then have to build them back up. So you've got to manage focus, right? Um, and the other thing is, if you have the ability to partner with someone like Kelly did, who is doing all the logistics and all of the work around the events, and all you are doing is actually driving the revenue and you're partnering together, that takes the weight of putting those events on. And then the last thing that I want to say, and maybe we can swing back to Wendy on this, is this event sounds really great, the event that you're producing. Events don't have to be huge and massive. If we look to the folks we all look to who are doing events in the industry, we look at the Texas Tribune, so they do Texas, they do the festival, right? But they do 50 smaller events across Texas throughout the course of the year. Um, and they are selling sponsorships that are, they have many sponsors who are sponsoring those events in multiple towns. But those events, depending upon the, the town size, are smaller, far smaller in scope, sometimes 25 people. So events don't have to be enormous. And I know at Berkeley side, you guys did some really interesting smaller events. We did. It was so when I first started, um, today's my sixth year anniversary with Berkeley side. Wow. Um, but I started selling, and we were very excited that, so we, there are 120,000 people in Berkeley. And uh, when I came on board, they were very excited that they had 40,000 unique visitors a month. And I started selling, and nobody knew what Berkeley side was. Uh, so we put on two free business forums. Um, Monday night after 6 o'clock, when retailers, p business people can actually come. Um, and we did panels on, at the time in, in Berkeley, what was happening with the economy. Uh, we did a micro, you know, looking at from, from people within the community and macro, sort of looking generally what was happening in the country. We also opened the, the mic to that event, and that brought on the rat cam. There was a, a local merchant who got up and said, no one wants to talk about what's happening on Telegraph Avenue across from my store. There's an empty lot which happened to be owned and still owned by his competitor. Um, and um, the street people are throwing their pizza rinds in there, and it's full of rats. So one of my partners uh, went out at dusk and took a camera, and we started on YouTube. You can still find the um, 
video of the rats. It got picked up by all the local news stations. But we started exposing ourselves. So I think it's a really good way to start. Uh, my second event, I had a local bank that came in and brought pads and pens, and we looked more at innovation and entrepreneurs. We also had this fantasy that um, there are three pretty famous Michaels that live in Berkeley. Michael Shabon, the novelist, uh, Michael Lewis, who wrote Moneyball, um, and Michael Pollan, who teaches at the university, works for the New York Times, is you know, known for the omnivore's dilemma. And we kind of said, what would happen if we got all three of them on stage? Um, we got them to agree one of them had a connection to a nonprofit that they insisted a certain amount of the profits go to. Um, in case you didn't know, for most events that say they are working for a nonprofit, they usually are giving 10 to 20 percent of the profits to the nonprofits. They're still, you can still make money off of it and, and work with a nonprofit. That event, uh, the three Michaels in Berkeley, sold out within about four hours. Um, and the tickets were about 130, I think. There was more money if you went to a private reception with them. Um, so those are really what got us started, and I think they're a great way to go. We do also do open offices, which is goes with the free beer, free wine philosophy. Um, we didn't really have offices until a year ago, and so we would work all remotely, and people wanted to know who we are. We also do a lot of tabling so people know who we are, which doesn't quite count as events, but has that same amount of work. Um, in terms of the amount of work that this event takes, we do hire a project manager um, who has an amazing volunteer staff that takes care of everything. Um, we do a lot of in-kind on, on the food, so all the food for the party. I've got a paella maker and 400 cupcakes coming, and a lot of that is in-kind sponsorship. Um, we also do a pop-up bookstore, which uh, they they make sure that they have all of the books of all of the speakers. And all of that now at year four is pretty, I mean, it's so much easier than it was. The other thing we really learned, and I guess it's sort of that free beer, free wine, um, we have many more coffee breaks now than we ever had in the first two. Because people wanted to come out and talk. They wanted to connect with one another, um, and that, it, it turned out to be something, I mean, I have a local grocery store who is sponsoring all my coffee breaks, and um, they're doing the work. Very nice. Can so, I just add one real quick thing? Yes. There is risk in events. You have to be careful to mitigate the risk. Uh, we haven't done an event in at least eight years, and uh, we rented a room at a restaurant and hoped a lot of people would come and order the paella. And we brought home tray and trays and trays and trays of paella. <laughs> you know, and it, it was a few thousand bucks. Uh, our traffic wasn't very high at the time. We just didn't calculate it. So if your site is new mm -hmm. and you don't have a lot of traffic, if you're still looking at, you know, you look at your users on that. You know, if, if you need an event with hundreds of people, think in terms of 1% of your readership. Mm -hmm. you, got, you know, something along those lines. Like, it's, it's got to be realistic for you to be able to reach enough people to fill the room. Uh, that said, there are restaurants now that are doing community nights where you can just, uh, they have a room set aside and, and for a community organization to do a fundraiser. They will do a happy hour food all night for nothing and, and take the money from the bar. And apparently it works. Uh, so we've been playing, kind of toying with the idea of doing that ourselves. And low scale. If you need a speaker, you know, if your site is tiny, Paying a speaker is probably not your is not your thing because that, that's a break even opportunity, you know, and that's good. That's right. That's good. And Did you hear Wendy said we don't pay anyone? So there are a couple of big takeaways from from that. And Dylan gave me the hand a couple of minutes ago, so I don't want him to give me the hand again or throw something at me. But so we're gonna have to circle. But yeah, the finger is next. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but a couple of big takeaways on events, they, they do require resources and they can be risky. Um, you know, Wendy talked about we don't pay anyone, right? 
Kelly talked about finding partnerships. So these are all things that are incredibly advisable. Um, Wendy said in kind. And so does everyone know what in kind is? That means trade it for promotion on your site. So you're trading food for promotion at your event and at, on, on your site. Um, in kind always happens at open rate. It's your highest rate. So those are great ways to enable you to do events. The other thing that I want to say about events is events don't have to be big and hairy and events can be for you. Um, so there are businesses in your community who want to know about digital advertising or how to write a press release or how to market themselves digitally or how to play in that space. So we used to do things in conjunction with um, uh, entrepreneur shops, the chamber, uh, local banks. We would find sponsors. We did things called clicks and coffee. The risk was we brought coffee. And we would do some education. Here's how you, you know, here's how you effectively do search engine marketing. It was very general. It wasn't it wasn't all about us, but as a result of that, we always were able to pick up additional business and advertisers. So I think we may have time for one or two questions. Aha. Actually, mine is not a question. I want to share an experience that we had at the Berkshire Edge. When we were first starting, I wanted to make sure that we were prominent in the business community because I knew you know, we were starting to go out for advertising and I wanted people to know who we were and that we were intending to make a major contribution to the, to the discussions in the community. So we, we had a, an economic development summit. It was really very easy to, uh, to plan. Um, I got a sponsor from a local bank and it turned out that the, the vice president who gave me the money from the local bank had an enormous Rolodex. And we went through and we picked out only about 120 people whom we thought were influentials in the community. And the, uh, the event was private invita by invitation only because you know, we, were, we wanted to sort of make a buzz um, among the important people in the community. We went to a local inn, they catered it, the, the bank sponsored it. I went to the local cable access and they taped it and we ran it on our site, we streamed it on our site after, afterward. Um, it was very successful. It, it wasn't a revenue generator, but it built relationships for us with the influentials in the community and the major business leaders in the community um, we, this, the, what we talked about was, you know, what infrastructure do we have to build now in order to have a robust economy in the future? And so we had four panelists who spoke, you know, very well. They were local leaders. It was an easy event to do, actually. And we're going to do another one next year. But I think it really put us on the map as a, a player in our community, which we wouldn't have been able to do if we just, you know, we're doing it on the basis of our editorial. So um, I recommend you think about that if you're new. Very good. All right. So, oh, I have, oh, we'll do one question. Can you yell it? And then we're going to wrap. Can you talk about real estate in about 30 seconds? <laughs> can, you talk about, can, somebody, can you guys talk about real estate in 10 seconds? Um, we. Yeah, we, we do a showcase home, which has been a good money maker for us. Uh, we'll, we'll write it for the, they just give us the number on MLS. We go look it up. We pull the pictures from MLS. We write it from the description on MLS. We send it to them. They approve it. We run it. We charge $300. We have real estate Thursday. So every Thursday we have the just sold, which is sponsored. We have the showcase home, which was paid for. And um, we at one point had the just listed, but we lost our sponsor to that. So I'm trying to resell that. I'm not doing it's very labor intensive. I'm not doing it unless somebody's paying for it. But and then um, we have section sponsors for the real estate, and so and for any of our sections. But that's been popular as well. Yeah, I mean, real estate lends itself to uh, native advertising very much so. Uh, we have just listed, we have just uh, reduced in price. We have a real estate columnist in that we have like a 20 person waiting list to people who want to be the next columnist because we don't, we only allow one per topic, uh, one columnist per topic. We have a real estate section through a vendor called Playster, 
Um, so you can uh, go and see, uh, you know, listings on there. It's just, uh, you know, people in your communities will treat real estate like sport to some degree. They want to know what, you know, if it's up or down, what's happening. Uh, oh, and the one other thing we do is uh, just uh, listed or, 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 or uh, deal with it or what is it? Listing of the day. Uh, so it's, you know, a home listing, typically one that's going to be open house uh, the uh, coming weekend. And uh, the trick about that is you have to be cognizant of the real estate, your real estate agent's margins. So you can't price it so high that it doesn't make sense for them to do it. But if you price it low enough where it's, a, it's something that, that seems uh, like a good idea, uh, you, you will continue getting that business. So always make Scott, sure that you're, the price is equal to your, the labor that you have to put into and, it. And, and, and maybe staff. some of you others can chime in on those too. When, when you're trying to create value through scarcity, like with limiting the, the column, how frequent are those columns? Weekly. Weekly? Okay. We do, a, so for the real estate advertiser, we do, a, we package it with their their monthly banner and they do once, they get a once a week slot. So it's apartment of the week. But we, I mean, we could build it out, but right now we don't want five of those a day. So that makes it more exclusive. They, you can reserve a day of the week. So has anyone in the room seen Curbed? Yeah, so I mean, you know, real estate is news, real estate is content. So you can do creative applications around real estate as Curb is proving in many major cities across the US. Um, and there are interesting applications that you can do with it. So I think it was Scott that said, hey, you've got to make sure that real estate is priced well or take into consideration the realtor's margins. So just as a little FYI for you guys, NAR recommends, the National Association of Realtors made a recommendation a few years ago that realtors invest 15% of their share of the commission of a listing. So if you put that into context and say the average home listing is say at a 6% commission of the sales price split by two people, then split again by a, a broker and an agent, the agent's portion that's left is the portion that NAR is suggesting that they spend 15% of on all of their marketing. So you can do the math. Um, I can send you the formula as well, but when you think about real estate opportunities and real estate pricing, think about that audience because it's very easy to price them out of the market. Um, real estate in many cases either has to be large exclusivity for a broker or if you want a volume play, you want lots of realtors, it's got to be a lower amount. Also, Scott mentioned Playster. Are you all familiar with Playster? So Playster is a platform. There are a multitude of these as well. It's a platform that will house all of your local real estate listings on your site. It's an IDX search site, so you can bring real estate content through listings onto your site. Then you can do some smart things with those to um, use those to promote content, newest million dollar listing or whatever. And you can also um, enable realtors or brokers to say highest price listings, their highest price listings, their newest listings, um, and and I think I think Kenny probably has some ad tools that could enable those to go in some rotations, um, and also the video vendor that I talked about yesterday has a um, has a um, an opportunity that could allow those listings to flow through a, an ad module um, like video opportunity. So they like those. So anything else? I'm going to get the finger. 